I'm Jeremy. I'm a data scientist. You can tell I wear binary. <laughs> I'm just like you. <laughs> uh, so, you know, us data scientists do some pretty cool stuff nowadays. I think the work we do is pretty valuable, right? We, uh, we build the machines that recommend the books. We're, um, uh, we build the search engines. Uh, we uh, figure out who gets loans and who doesn't get loans. Uh, we are responsible for hundreds of billions of dollars in the world's economy. So, I got some questions about that. If we're doing all this cool stuff and uh, we're doing valuable work, how come we aren't all rich? How come we aren't all famous? How come we spend half our time filling out TPS reports rather than doing kick-ass models every day? How come we have to spend our time cleaning data, doing management reports, changing the color on this graph to a different shade of green because it's not corporate standard, damn it? Why is it that we all know who Roger Federer is, a guy who's very good at hitting a little yellow ball across the net? But who's this? This is the world's greatest data scientist. Why is she not rich and famous? You guys know about the KDD Cup? The KDD Cup is the world's longest running data mining competition. It's the premier competition in the world for the last 15 years. Claudia won it in, 19, in 2007, and then again in 2008, and then again in 2009. And then this year in KDD, which as well as running this competition happens to be the premier machine learning research conference, she won the best paper prize. So why do we not, all know, not know who she is, yet we know who Roger Federer is, this guy who's very good at hitting a ball over a net? Why is it that our kids, when they're born, parents don't say, Oh, I so hope he turns out to be a great data scientist. I would be so proud. And kids, when they go to university, don't go, yeah, what's that course you do again so I can become a kick-ass data scientist? In fact, the thing that was on the homepage of Strata until yesterday was a quote from McKinsey. The guy who did this report for McKinsey was uh, here earlier in the week of strata, uh, strata conferences. And he said that a significant constraint on realizing value from big data will be the shortage of talent. So not only are we doing important work, but there's not enough of us doing it. So surely we must be all making a hell of a lot of money, right? Well, I don't quite know why these things are not happening, but I do have a vision about the way to change this. And the way to change this is to make sure that us guys, the guys that do this work, can be valued for the work that we can do. That people can recognize the guys that can really solve the problems, rather than the snake oil salesmen at big co companies that I won't mention their names today. So I'm gonna do this by virtue of a simple little example. <clears throat> And what I'm going to show you is that a really interesting approach called data mining competitions can solve some of the world's toughest problems faster and cheaper and better than ever before. And then I'm going to show you how using this approach we can actually change the nature of work for the data scientist and shift the technology curve up in machine learning more generally. So this simple problem I'm going to show, show, show you how to solve is a simple problem of mapping dark matter. So what's dark matter? Well, in 1934, it was noticed that there was a slight problem with our galaxy. When you actually added up the amount of stuff in our galaxy, there's not enough gravity to keep it together. It should be flying apart. Now, clearly it's not. So they did the obvious thing and said, well, there's shit there and we can't see it. It must be dark. So let's call it dark matter. Amazingly enough, I don't know if you saw this uh, earlier this week in The Economist, in fact, it looks like for the first time we may actually find ways of seeing this dark matter. Now that's very exciting and this is one big piece of the puzzle. The second big piece of the puzzle is the question of 
even if we can see it, where in the universe is it? Really brilliant idea was built, uh, built up by a consortium of scientists from places like NASA and the Royal Astronomical Society and the European Space Agency, where even if they can't see this stuff, they could actually work out where it is. And so let me show you quickly how this system works. So I'll use my expert drawing methods. So here's how it works, right? Um, so over here we've got the planet Earth, okay? And up here in the sky, we've got galaxies. Now, here's what these guys realized. Wherever dark matter is, let's say it's here, we can't see it. But we do know one thing about it, and that is that by definition it has mass. And therefore, by definition, it has gravity. And we know that gravity bends light. So here's what happens. So light comes from this very distant galaxy hits the dark matter and is bent. So now our telescopes here on Earth, pointing up here, will see a slightly different image. And so whereas it started like that, it's maybe slightly sheared and slightly skewed. And so in this way, we could actually discover exactly where dark matter is in the universe. And this is a problem of mapping dark matter. Here's the thing that makes it hard. Problem number one. This telescope actually has slight distortions in the lens. It's not perfect. There is no perfect telescope. Problem number two, we've got this stuff called the atmosphere, which actually refracts the light as well. So there's actually a hell of a lot of noise in this signal. So I think it'd be fair to say that all the kind of, a lot of the really tough work here was done by this consortium. Um, but there was this key piece that was left over. So what happened was this consortium decided to run a competition to see whether they can pick up uh, one last piece of this, which is how do you find the signal in all this noise? And they decided to run a data mining competition. And uh, I was uh, lucky enough to be asked to help with this. And I knew I was in a room with some serious people when I got an email which started laying out this for me and one of the paragraphs said, okay Jeremy, so this is basically how we map dark matter and this and therefore this and then this next section here, um, uh, I don't know if Jeff's in the room, maybe you can remind me exactly what it said, it was like this, this section here uh, is a simple derivation based on general relativity, I think is what it said and I was like, yeah, <laughs> I can see that. <laughs> so something amazing happened. We ran this competition, and for the first time in my life, I saw data scientists as celebrities. Let me show you what happened. On now, there should be a video here. Let me try that again. It's always the way, isn't it? After so a hard a day's work, I, I like to get stuck into a crossword. It's better and better results. Be fierce. But does go. Kaggle really help solve big problems? On May 23rd of this year, NASA, the European Space Agency, and the Royal Astronomical Society posted one of the great problems of our time how to map the presence of dark matter in galaxies when we can't see it. The universe is behaving a little bit oddly. It's behaving as though there's more matter uh, than we can actually observe. So the competition is to build algorithms that detect this additional matter and where exactly it is. In less than a week, a glaciologist from Cambridge had produced an algorithm that outperformed those developed in over a decade of research at the space agencies. So Martin, how did you do it? I'm a glaciologist and one of the things that I do is I look at satellite imagery of the fronts of glaciers in Greenland and try and monitor the position of the front of the glacier over the course of a year. These images are often corrupted with things like there's clouds in the way, there might be some sensor noise, there's probably more bits of ice sitting in the fjord in front of the glacier which look very much like the glacier. And so one of the things we have to do is guess where the glacier front position is based on these noisy images. 
glacier fronts and mapping dark matter in the universe, they seem like two markedly different things. It turns out that when you're looking at an image of a galaxy far, far away, it's quite noisy, there are things in the way, there's blurring happening. It's got a lot of the same problems as working in the glaciological context. So that's uh, Martin O'Leary, and uh, I encourage you guys to check this out. It's on uh, ABC's Catalyst TV show, and uh, you can watch the whole thing about data mining competitions and some of the impacts they have. Uh, they've put it up on the web. And, you know, this is pretty exciting to me because i never seen a data scientist on TV before. Um, and, you know, this is interesting as well because it makes me think about that McKinsey quote about the lack of talent. And it makes me wonder how many glaciologists that McKinsey spoke to when they did their research about how much talent there is in this field. The interesting thing is there's so many of us data scientists around the world hiding away in places that you don't expect to find us. And Martin Leary is one of these great examples. In fact, such was the impact of this competition, it was actually written up and posted on the White House. Uh, within about a week and a half of it starting. Uh, and again, you know, it's one of the very few times, I think the only time I've seen uh, data scientists quoted on the White House. So here's an interesting example of, of how data mining competitions can solve big problems and can also surface unexpected talent. Why is it that this happens? So the theory behind this, I think, is that there are two pieces. One is about a diversity of people looking at a diversity of problems. And the second is about the competitive dynamic that forces the ego of a hardcore data scientist to want to win. And this graph actually shows both of these. Let me take you through it. This is the mapping dark matter competition over the, what was it, Anthony, eight week period? About eight weeks that it was running. So, so here's Martin O'Leary, uh, the glaciologist. And you know, if you think about uh, what he's describing, it, it makes a lot of sense, right? We've kind of talked about how, how you look out into the sky you know, at glaciers from here. What he was doing with his glaciology research is he, his telescopes are up here, if you like. They're, they're satellites. And he's looking at fuzzy glaciers down here and trying to see have from, from year to year, have they moved? Have they changed shape? So he's got the same problems. He's got this atmospheric refraction. He's got these fuzzily defined shapes. And of course, there's the pixelation and the noise and the satellite. So you can kind of see how he's kind of doing the whole thing upside down, um, which I can empathize with as an Australian. Everything's kind of upside down for us. Um, and then what happened was he got passed by a couple of couple of interesting people. So after a few days, he made this big breakthrough. And a few days later, for example, this guy, Ali Hussain, came along. Now, Ali Hussain is a guy, again, who probably was not interviewed in the McKinsey report because he's from Qatar. And he studies uh, Arabic signatures for the purpose of fraud analysis. So his work is to say, is this Arabic signature and this Arabic signature written by the same hand? And like, my drawing's not very good, so I'm going to stop drawing things for you here. But you get the idea, right? So he's looking at slight movements of features across kind of ill-defined ill images. And it turns out his kind of algorithms also work really well on this problem. And you can see what's happened here, right? After a few days, in fact, Martin got to a point. Here's, here's Martin again. Martin got to a point where it looked like he had got this nailed. And for a few weeks, he was in front. This is the period where the uh, TV show was done and the White House wrote it up and he's suddenly a celebrity. And so you can imagine what happened when somebody else comes along and passes him. So you can see this back and forth. It's like a running race because in a well set up data mining competition, there should be a real time leaderboard where you can always see exactly how you're going compared to everybody else. And it forces you to go to the next stage. And so you can see here that uh, uh, Ali from Qatar eventually worked out what Martin, well, not what Martin was doing, but he found a way to get even better results than Martin did. Uh, and uh, then a neuroscientist from Harvard came along with a whole new approach and did better still. And eventually, on the very last day, some particle physicists suddenly found a whole new approach and ended up winning the competition. So 
How well did these guys go? I'll tell you how well they went. When Anthony and I set up this competition, we spoke to this guy, Thomas Kitching, at the Royal Astronomical Society, and he was hoping maybe somebody can find a new angle here. And if somebody can find a new angle, we'll fly them out to the JPL, and they can actually work on implementing this algorithm in their real systems. This was so effective that, in fact, everybody on this chart was invited and a whole bunch more. So they've got, I don't know, how many people do they invite? Like 10? About 10 people from this competition all found totally new approaches to mapping dark matter. Right. So the power of competition is pretty extraordinary. So there's a interesting question here, which is that if data mining competitions can be so powerful, and the theory behind them suggests that they should work better and give better results than other approaches, why aren't we all using them all the time? And there's a few things that make it quite difficult to do that. The first is that actually setting up a data mining competition is really difficult. Right? You guys all remember the Netflix prize, right? What a cool idea, one million dollar prize to improve movie recommendations. What you may not realize is to set up that prize was a hell of a lot of work. And a lot of the best minds in this area worked together to create this. So they had to set up a whole new platform for it. They had to figure out privacy considerations, IP issues, um, leakage uh, problems. Uh, you know, how do we set up this whole thing, a community platform? Very, very big job. If you're Netflix, maybe it's possible. Um, but even in the case of Netflix, it turned out to be a little bit too hard. In the end, there were privacy problems which they didn't realize, and they did end up getting sued at the end of that competition, which unfortunately meant there was no Netflix 2 prize, as they hoped there would be. So what we've decided to do is to create a new platform which makes it as easy to create a data mining competition as it is to sell a sofa on eBay. And so this is this platform. So let's take a look. Um, here's a few competitions. So the platform's called Kaggle. Um, and there's a few competitions ranging from the $3 million Heritage Health Prize. And if you're around tomorrow, you can come and see the guys who um, won the Progress Prize for that um, as they receive their Progress Prize check. Uh, there's credit scoring happening. Now, obviously, an improved credit scoring algorithm would be worth billions to the retail uh, banking industry and even commercial banking industry. Um, one of America's uh, largest insurers is now running their actuarial models, their key IP, through this method. Um, let's take a look at this one. So here's the claim prediction challenge, which is all about building a vehicle risk model. Um, it's a really interesting piece of work, uh, and anybody who's worked in actuarial science will know that there's some decades of research behind this. Now, the company running this competition is one of America's top actuarial teams is at this company. It's one of the very largest uh, vehicle insurers, motor insurers in the US. So here's a group of actuaries who have studied actuarial science, worked in an insurance company doing actuarial stuff, they must be pretty good at this shit, right? Well, here's what happened. After they put this up, two days later, within two days, their very best vehicle model had been passed. So Anthony and I received an email from their chief actuary that day. That just had one word in it. Ouch. <laughs> so here's where we're at now. It's, uh, I think it's still running. Yeah, it's still running, 20 days to go. Um, and let's take a look at the leaderboard. So every single Kaggle competition looks exactly the same. There's the data page, there's the leaderboard page. You know, this is the cool thing about machine learning, right? We all have the skills that let us tackle everything from mapping dark matter to, to actuarial science. It means that every one of these competitions on the website, it looks the same, you know, test set, training set, data, aerometric, no problem. And in fact, you know, the same kind of guys that will win the dark matter competition can also go and win the uh, actuarial competition. So if we scroll down, I don't know if you're familiar with the Gini metric. It's um, linearly related to the area under the ROC curve metric, so it's basically a measure of uh, the effectiveness of a classifier. Uh, wow, it's a long way down. Here we go, finally. This is 
um, America's, America's top actuarial team's best actuarial model would be in 21st place with a 0 0.07 power, our productivity. And right now, with 20 days to go, that's nearly been tripled. So I spent uh, 10 years building an insurance analytics company, and I know exactly what that's worth. That's worth hundreds of millions of dollars, right there. How much is it costing them? Must be expensive. Wow, 10 grand. And this is interesting, right? Because you guys are data scientists, you know. right? If somebody can give you a cool data set and an interesting problem and the opportunity to challenge yourself against the best in the world and to prove yourself, that's enough. right? Now, I want to find ways, and I'm going to talk about ways that we're going to become rich and famous. right? But even before that, we're solving really, really cool problems. OK. Um, so I want to talk a bit about this issue around the competitive dynamic. Because these leaderboards, they do something quite magic. Uh, and once again, I'm not the best guy to explain this kind of stuff, so I'm going to leave it up to the ABC, uh, who created a really nice analogy about why it is that competitions, uh, this competitive instinct, leads to better results. Competitors are given the same sets of data. Using this, competitors try to build a data model to solve hey, look, a predictive a problem. <laughs> Allowing competitors to see how their models compare to others drives better and better results. Well, Tanya, this is the leaderboard. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I initially started, I was about 55th, which made you think, what's, does someone else know that I don't? How are you going now? So, currently a third on the leaderboard. Third? Third. So you're third in the running for $3 million. Well, bad thing is the top two win the money. <laughs> so I've got to try a bit harder. <laughs> no, no prizes for coming third at the moment, unfortunately. So that's interesting. So that's the uh, Heritage Health Prize leaderboard. And that interview was done, gee, it must have been a couple of months ago now. Uh, so Phil Briley, his name on uh, Kaggle, his username is Sally Marley. Uh, let's see how he went. Well, as we speak, his team is now number one. And I've been here, right? So before I started working for Kaggle, I was a competitor on Kaggle. Um, and um, I got totally addicted. And, and I know, you know what Phil said just now? He said, he said, those guys in first, I wonder what they found that I haven't found. And that's exactly what it feels like, particularly if initially you're leading and then somebody else passes you, and it's like, oh, shit, what have they found that I haven't found? And you can't sleep until you can figure this out. Right? I mean, it, it's not that you have to spend all of your waking hours sitting at the computer. And in fact, if you guys are interested in competing, don't, right? I've discovered that the best results come when you don't sit in front of the computer. But you do, you, do, you just sleep on it. You just let it keep fermenting there, and you come up with whole new approaches. Right? It's a very interesting feedback for your own data mining practice, in my experience. So, um, oh, and you know, by the way, if you're wondering if like, it's safe for a data mining competition addict to join a data mining competition company, I don't know. <laughs> but it's kind of cool. <laughs> So, so there's issue number one, is in um, creating repeat data mining, making it easy to run data mining competitions. So as I say, you know, creating this platform that makes it dead easy to create an effective competition really helps. The second issue is around privacy, I think. So to, in the past, to create a data mining competition, you've actually needed to release your data on the internet. Now, there are some tricks you can do. So for example, the Heritage Health Prize, I think, um, uh, here's Khalid. So Khalid worked on the Heritage Health Prize, and his team found a whole new way of anonymizing medical data. And they're currently, they're going to be releasing a paper about this method quite soon, which allowed for the first time medical data to be put up on the internet in that way. Um, the insurance company that you saw doing the actuarial models, we found a new way of doing that such that their dependent variable 
we basically changed it so that people are modelling the residuals of their existing model rather than modelling the actual um, car accident costs themselves. There's various things you can do. But in the end, privacy is a big issue. And here I'd particularly like to mention some great research done by a uh, Stanford student, a uh, Stanford uh, postdoc uh, named uh, Arvin Narayan. How do you say his name? Narayanan. Narayanan. Thank you, Arvin Narayanan. And Arvin, Arvin came up with this really great idea, which is that, okay, why don't you do it this way? First of all, run a competition where you're using like synthetic data or very, very, very heavily anonymized data or some kind of meta problem. And see who does well on that and then invite them back into a whole new competition where they kind of sign NDAs and consulting agreements and background checks and the whole thing, and then kind of the top few do the real competition with the real data. And we thought that is a really cool idea. But what if we take it one step further? We've actually now got the results of dozens of competitions. So here's the... Here's the Kaggle leaderboard, if you like, as it is now, across multiple competitions. This is like the ATP tennis tour of data mining. Across multiple competitions, how are people going? And so we can now see um, who are the people that you would most want to invite to your data mining competition. And we can do even more interesting things with this. We can actually say, which of the people in past competitions that have not only kicked us, but they've kicked us in completely different ways? They've actually entered solutions that are fairly orthogonal, yet both did well. And so we can now start to actually automatically generate groups of people that if they competed together on a competition, could give the best answer, whilst also maintaining privacy. So we're very creative people. We call this the private competition. So the private competition is the next stage in data mining competitions. And so what we expect to happen, we expect to see tens of thousands of these private competitions being run over the following years. Because if you think about it, data mining competitions are creating better results on problems that were previously unsolved, cheaper and faster. What if we could do this for every damn predictive modelling problem that we had? Private competitions plus the leaderboard structure we've described that allow these private competitions to be filled effectively seem to be the secret to letting this happen. And what does that mean for people that practice the art and science of data science? Well, what it means is that when other insurance companies look at this vehicle claims model and say, oh my God, our competitors just added an extra $100 million to their profit by running this competition, we want to run one too. And suddenly every insurance company is trying to do this. And they all want access to the very best talent, all of whom has been measurably judged in the world's first true labor meritocracy. They're going to have to hike up that prize money. They're going to have to be charged, you know, putting up $100,000, a million dollars, and so forth until the prize money is approaching the actual value that they're getting out of this. And they won't just be able to say, oh, first place gets it all. No, they're going to have to say every single person we invite to this competition will get paid. It's kind of more like golf, right? As long as you make the cut, if you come 64th, you'll get a bit, 63rd, a bit more, 62nd, a bit more. So in this kind of structure, you can see a whole new kind of labor market. It's a labor market where it looks more like sport in its structure and more like sport in terms of the best performers being paid $25 million plus, just like in other labour markets where there is objective measurable outcomes. And yet, this is a labour market which is working on really important and valuable things, not so much like hedge fund trading. <laughs> so... This is part of the solution to this big question. And, and I wanted to think more about what this world looks like. So in this world where we've got tens of thousands of competitions running, rather than having companies, we've got guilds, leagues, whatever we call them, people that come together and work on interesting problems and appropriate problems all the time. 
working with the people they most want to work with, working wherever they most want to be, using the tools that they most want to use. And they can see their performance objectively. I think this is a really interesting thought because actually you can now start to think, people thinking, you know what, when I get out of university, I do want to be a data scientist. It's where the money is, it's where the fun is, it's where all the cool kids go. Hedge fund trading, yeah, you know, that's, that's, that's pretty low nowadays. It's just, it's just another type of data mining competition, really. And I can actually see this changing the technology curve. I can see universities saying, Jesus, man, we haven't yet got a data science course. Let's get to work. I can see, I can see people thinking, you know, I've got computer programming skills. I kind of like math. Here's a way I can apply my skills in really interesting ways. And I've already started to see a bit of this happening. I, I want to give you an example of someone who I'm, I'm really quite fond of. Um, and his name is uh, Eugen. So Eugen is a guy who came to me uh, mid-late last year. Um, and I actually bumped into him at an R users group meeting. And he was at a job which he, you know, he quite liked. It was OK. But he wanted to do something more. He wanted to be a great data scientist. And he said, Jeremy, what do I do? And I said, well, I can share some experiences. Personally, I found when I started entering some data mining competitions, and at first I didn't do so well, and at the end of the competition I read the paper and the blog post by the guys that won, I learned something a little bit more. And the next time I did it, I got a little bit better. Why don't you try it too? And he did. He tried it, and he came 113th. Well, it's a start. So he said, well, you know, what should I do next? It's like, just keep trying. Learn from that experience. You know, the, 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 the trick is here just to enter. Because every day you can enter again. And every day you can see if your score improved. And every day you're getting feedback about the techniques and the processes and the systems you're using. So over time, he quickly improved. Suddenly he's nearly in the top ten. And now suddenly he's in fifth. And then he got invited by Ali from Qatar to join a team with him on the Mapping Dark Matter Challenge. And together they came third. And now he's been invited to the JPL to help them find dark matter. So this is so exciting, because this is a kid who's, who's you know, he's a reasonably recent graduate. Uh, he's got brilliant skills. But if it wasn't for this, nobody would have known what he can do. And in fact, because of, partly because of his success in competitions, he got a fantastic job. He's now working at Deloitte's in Deloitte Analytics, one of the premier analytic teams in the world. Not only that, Deloitte saw the power of this and they went, oh yeah, that's cool. We're going to run a private competition. So they ran a private competition for all 170,000 of their staff were invited to join to find out who were the best Deloitte analysts in the world. And Eugene came second. So everybody in Deloitte's globally now knows this kid in Melbourne and knows he's one of their stars. And this is what happens in a real meritocracy. There's no snake oil. There's no bullshit. So in terms of how does this look, I think there will still be the public competitions, there will still be the Heritage Health Prizes and the Mapping Dark Matter Challenges. They're important for so many reasons. For one thing, they're the way that people get started. Not everybody can be invited to play in Wimbledon right away. Roger Federer won't play me in tennis. Right? You've got to earn that. So you can start on Kaggle and you can start on the simpler competitions. Some are going to be free. Some are going to be quite low prize money. Or you can just uh, tackle competitions which we've actually run in the past, and it'll say, hey, had you have entered this, this is how you would have gone. So you slowly build up the profile. But it's not that you have to impress anybody with, with your style. As soon as you do well, everybody knows who you are. As soon as you do well, our systems know who you are, and we will start inviting you to these really exclusive competitions. And this is the vision I have for how data scientists will be truly valued for the first time. Thank you.
Do we have time for questions or a little bit? Any questions? I was just wondering, um, Roger Federer is probably not going to build a better racket to, uh, to uh, play better, but data scientists might build better tools in the process of, and I was wondering, has there been any stories of people doing table competitions and then making really cool tools to do it and then releasing those tools? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, but frankly, at this stage, we, we at Kaggle have to work harder on providing the platforms to make that easier. Um, so up until now, we've been a tiny little company. Um, and over the next few months, you're going to be hearing a lot about us um, because we've just got a bunch of funding and we're going to be hiring a whole bunch of people and doing a whole bunch of things. And one of the things I'm most excited about is the stuff we're going to be doing around kind of uh, community and infrastructure development. So we're actually going to be developing things like machine learning libraries. And so these tools that get built as a result of these competitions, currently they mainly live as papers on our blog or as descriptions. Um, you know, sometimes people will post the code, but we haven't particularly provided a place for them to put it or a way to search it or whatever. So, you know, there's been interesting breakthroughs made. Um, and I think more interesting than the breakthroughs themselves has been surfacing the techniques which already were there and now discovering how good they are. So for example, I reckon over half of our winners in some way use random forests. Okay? Well, you know, isn't that fascinating? Because random forests is like, I coded up my own random forest in less than a day. You know, it's, it's such an easy thing to build a random forest algorithm. And here's a general purpose tool that we've discovered actually can win competitions on a regular basis. We've also discovered that the top two tools used by successful competitors are R and MATLAB. So, you know, we can actually now say not so much around the breakthroughs, but around what are the actual people that may have success doing. So, yeah. Um, the IP, so the question is, are there any IP issues? Um, in general, IP issues are way less of a problem than you might first expect. And the reason why is slightly subtle, um, but it's really interesting. A machine learning algorithm contains two parts, a training algorithm and an actual parameterized model. The training algorithm effectively is a thing that puts the weights in the multi-layer perceptron, or the coefficients in the logistic regression, or um, the split points in the random forest. The training algorithm can have a lot of IP built into it and can be very sophisticated. The thing that it builds is like, take a logistic regression. It's just multiply these things together and add them up and stick them through a sigmoid function. Um, multi-layer perceptrons, not much more complicated. So the outcomes of these um, competitions are generally not the kind of stuff that can be protected by uh, patents or, and certainly not by copyright. Um, there are cases where companies actually want a model which, for whatever reason, they want to own. Um, and maybe it's the kind of model which genuinely can receive greater IP protection. And that would be a case where they would want to run a private competition. Um, and so part of the Kaggle platform is there's actually a page in the wizard for hosting a competition where you can enter custom rules. So our default rule is that the competitor gives a non-exclusive license for the host of the competition to use their model, which generally is exactly what you want. You want to be able to use it. But that's a position in the, in the wizard where you can actually replace that with a rule that describes a more complete IP transfer process. Okay. So thanks very much, guys. See you around.